and everybody welcome to sports talk happy monday we are nearing the end of may the memorial day holiday is near upon us and summer is coming up here as we want to welcome you to our program come to you virtual from our house in long beach california I am, of course, Ed, and I'm alongside my host, uh, Jesus, my co-host. <clears throat> Partner's been a while. How, how's things been? It's all right. It's all right. Could be worse. I'm by yourself. Uh, you know, you say here, another day, another podcast. Um, yes, sir. We've got a lot of things to talk about. So we just want to let you know we're live right now on Podbean, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Got a lot to talk about, so let's go ahead and get to one of the top stories today. And we're going to start off with the NBA, the NBA playoffs. Can't wait to talk about that one. Uh Uh-oh. Well, we're here. It's the final four in the NBA. And about an hour from now, we'll have game one of the Eastern Conference Finals between the Indiana Pacers and the Boston Celtics. I want to talk about this series first. How about Indiana? Everyone figured the Knicks were going to beat the Pacers and move on, but somehow the Pacers were able to hold off and force the Game 7 and just pretty much get in contention for a run at a title. So I'm going to start with you, partner. What was your reaction to the Pacers' performance in the last round? Yeah, I think it was uh, you got to give them credit for what they did. Because uh, they were underdogs. Nobody thought they were going to make it. But unfortunately, the Knicks had a lot of um, injuries coming into the Game 7. That's the thing about the playoffs, injury-wise, too. Whoever's healthier advances more. So Pacers pretty much were healthier. And got to give them props. They knocked out the New York Knicks. Uh, what was your reaction um, on Game 7 or them eliminating the Knicks? Well, the only simple thing I can think of is maybe about almost 30 years ago. I believe it was the 1994 playoffs. I remember the game where the Pacers took on the Knicks in Madison Square Garden and then the Pacers were trailing. And then Reggie Miller, man, he just like went on a scoring spree. He was shooting three after three after three. And I remember him doing the famous uh, Knicks choking pretty much that they were choking it away. And that series they did, and then now we talk about it now, 30 years later, you know, same thing. The famous Knicks choked happened again. And very sad because the Knicks had it going, but like you said, um, it was injuries and then just shorthanded. It was a bad time for that to happen. Oh, yeah, that famous... Miss Choke Pacers did end up losing that series, but um, this time around, um, <laughs> Tyrese Halliburton uh wore that famous sweater, uh, that's that famous um meme of it on his sweater, which I give Tyrese Halliburton a lot of credit. His his gameplay game, he's a playmaker slash scorer. Uh, every every team in the NBA would love to have a player like that, and um, yeah, congrats to the Pacers who I think they will get Paul George next year, in my opinion. Yeah, he is rumored to be one of their their, their um, goal-getters. I mean, you talk about Game 7, and what they did was very amazing. You know, they set a record from shooting. I mean, 67% from the field. I mean, anything that they made, anything that they threw, pretty much went in, pretty much counted. I mean, you don't see stuff like that often. You talk about having the uh, the high momentum, but I mean, Indiana, I mean, it's been a long time. You know, we talk about the NBA Finals. The last time this team was in the NBA Finals was all the way back to the year 2000 against the Lakers, in which the Lakers beat them in six. So it's been over 20 years. I mean, I can predict right now and say they can, they can go there. Now, let me ask you who... Um, Who's going to have more advantage at this night, tonight? Because, I mean, you look at Indiana. I mean, they play more games in Boston. Boston, you know, their series ended fast. Um, 
who who do you think you think Boston should there be any concern about um any rust you know for having so many off days? No, nah, I don't think so. I think uh, Boston has the advantage because um they have a great team. You know, even though they got a one of their key players, Porzingis, out, who's a seven seven footer who makes threes, rebounds, and assists. I think the Celtics are too good for the Pacers. I could see this uh, series ending in a game, uh, game five, uh, game six tops. Nothing past that. Uh, Boston are too good. Jalen Brown, J. Rue Holiday, Jaden, Jason Tatum, one of the uh, superstars of this generation, upcoming generation. Uh, even the the rest, I don't see it on the uh, on Boston side. We, we will see tonight, though. Well. I'm going to disagree and say that I might see a little bit of rust because, like I said, they've been off a few days. I mean, it's normal to have rust when you're off after a while, but then when you start getting into the rhythm of, of playing again, I think um, I think it's going to be uh, not going to be an issue for game two, but I think game one, expect to see a little bit of a rust. But, I mean, they're well-rested, so that's the advantage. And then the Knicks, I mean, the Pacers, excuse me, they might be at a disadvantage because they went through a hard seven-game fight. But they had the momentum. And if they can play like they did on Sunday, I mean, this could be a seven-game series too. I mean, it's just a matter of who can shoot the ball better between these two ball clubs. And, I mean, Boston does have the advantage here. On paper, they have the advantage. On stats and predictions, they have the advantage. But, again, that's why they play the game. You never know. Yeah, and um, Boston didn't end up traveling. They so they was they won their last game at home, so they stayed at home. Pacers meanwhile went to uh, play two more games, game seven, and they got to travel back to to where uh, to Pacers uh, Arena from New York. So I think that travel would uh, affect the Pacers more. And the Pacers are a fast paced team, not 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 great of a decent decent. Decent de- defensive team. Sorry for the tongue twister, but yeah, man, uh, I could see the the NBA Finals being the uh, Boston and Timberwolves. Even though we're we're gonna talk about that next uh that other game that happened. <laughs> How many times I have to tell you quit letting the ghosts out of the closet? <laughs> but um. Yeah. I mean, here's the here's the thing, and I'm probably gonna wrap this. Uh, I wanna I'm gonna probably wrap up my last part, my last uh, thoughts on this. The Celtics have been off for five days. Their last game they played was last Wednesday. It was the clinching game. Again, I do expect to see a little bit of a rust because they've been off for a while. <clears throat> Normally during the season, you average about one to two days off, and then you go back to play. Here, I mean. It was a good thing that they finished their series fast. But at the same time, you're playing a team that came off a seven-game series and they have the momentum. They think they could win because everyone figured this team was down last week. But somehow they were able to force a game seven and not that dominate game seven. So there's two differences there. There's two differences here. We'll know in about an hour from now. From now, the only thing I'm going to pay attention to this game is probably the first five minutes, <clears throat> because the first five minutes, or maybe the first twelve minutes, will determine what kind of game we're going to have, what kind of series we're going to have, and what the outcome will be like. Yeah, we will see tonight. Uh, but I think it will be um, whoever comes out after that halftime. It's always that after the halftime determines what happens. Then um, that Minnesota Timberwolves game and Nuggets. Woo! That was a great game seven series, which I watched game one, game two, game three, all, all seven games in which the Nuggets... Got upset by the Timberwolves and the old fashioned after halftime. They got a little bit of their own medicine that Timberwolves gave to the Nuggets, which Lakers should have. But got to give Timberwolves hella props, man. 
especially that unit defensively. Everybody contributes. Everybody's a facilitator on the court defensively. Every possession. And then they managed, the Timberwolves managed to advance. And now we'll be facing the Dallas Mavericks, which be a great, another great series partner. What you think about Timberwolves beating the Nuggets in seven games? that we've gone to this part let's let's just um say this for i believe the fourth time or the eighth time um there will be no repeat champion <clears throat> it's been a couple years since the last team repeated and just like jesus says the defending champion denver nuggets are out at the hands of the um Minnesota Timberwolves. <clears throat> we know that the Western Conference Finals is set. Um, it'll be the Mavericks and the and the Timberwolves. Um, shockingly, here the top two teams in the Western Conference fell: the Thunder and the current champs. But again, for the eight, for I believe the eighth time, they will there will no there will not be. A repeated champion, so that stretch is going to continue. Let me ask you this: Is it hard to repeat as champions into the year two thousand? Yes, I believe so. Um, you have to be. You have to pretty much have a full, healthy season without injuries, or pretty much your same team. I I felt like Nuggets had had it in them they were so close man they lost it they pretty much couldn't but yeah uh no i can't see it there's too much athleticism too much too much too much so no 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 is my answer how about yourself do you see a lot of back-to-back uh champions in this upcoming years or in this new era you know what the way the free agency market is and how the salary cap is, it's hard to have a squad and keep them for a long period of time. I mean, look at the way the year 2000 started. We had a three-peat team with the Lakers. You go on to the uh, later on in the 2000s, the San Antonio Spurs, they were up there. And then you have the Miami Heat. In the in the two thousand tens, um, they kind of like won multi titles, and then you look at the Golden State Warriors, who dominated the last of the twenty tens, and now we turn the page to twenty twenties, and you know we don't have a repeated champion, so it's just more of a I think it's more of business ways. Back then, it was more about commitment, um, dedication. Enthusiasm. Now I see it more like it's about money. It's about power. It's about kind of like being the leader of the team or maybe in charge of everything. So I think it's hard to repeat as champions with the way this current cap is. The state of the players. Because now it's just where do I want to go? You know, the reason they changed up the caps, the cap space rules and all that stuff is because the bigger cities were kind of getting the advantages when it came to uh, <clears throat> building dynamic squads. Again, I'm going to use Los Angeles as an example. Then you have like Miami who had a couple of decent players. Um... I'm looking at another big city. I mean, Houston had that. Uh, Dallas won a championship, but I mean, that's another big city that that's had the uh, was able to pay money. And then San Antonio. I think San Antonio is like a, a smaller city because I mean, Texas is a big state, but I think San Antonio is not much of a big city. But then again, they have basketball excellence there. 
And then you look at these little city teams that are up there, you know, city teams like Milwaukee. Um, you look like small cities like Oklahoma City, but look how they're pro pro progressing now. You know, all these other city, these small city teams, it's what about them? No one wants to come play for them. It's about money. It's about a lot of things. So it's just, uh, I just think it's uh, it's a lot of things. That's why a lot of these squad players don't stay long. Before, there were players that stay there maybe five, more than five years, up to ten years. Maybe, hell, even sometimes throughout their career. So, it's a... It's a very different sport than it was back then. I'll say that. I mean, feel free to jump in if you want about about this. Yeah, it's more on the business side. Uh, there's a lot of players who came out even saying, um, or this past recent years, uh, they thought they were gonna be there forever. Then, one one during the season, the trade uh, deadline, they just get traded, which has happened a lot. Uh, one uh recent one that a lot of people know, a lot of NBA fans was the Isaiah Thomas one, when he was with Boston. Uh, they made it to the playoffs. He carried a great team, but then um, the next year they just let him go. So yeah, it's more on the business side, as you said. I agree with you. Like back then, there's players like the the old cast, like Tim Duncan, Ginobili stayed with the Spurs forever. You got the Kobe with the Lakers. You got um Tony Parker with the Spurs. Man. Oh yeah, Tony Parker. Many, many more, man. So yeah, I agree with you. And I think it's it's gonna keep on being like that unless they make some other rule. There's always rules change in everything. Well, I'll give you some stories about the trade, the cap. You know, let's you remember remember in 04, when the Lakers had the big four, Kobe Bryant, Carmelo, and then Gary Payne all, all together. Yeah. So Shaq, um, when Shaq left the Lakers, he gave an interview um, in the summer, in the offseason. And he kind of like explained why he decided to get traded. He said that throughout the 04, 05, the 03, 04 season, um, they were in contract negotiation talks. He was in contract negotiation talks. Phil Jackson was in contract negotiation talks. Kobe Bryant was was in contract negotiation talks. So your best players were in contract negotiation talks in the middle of a big season where you got these four great athletes making a title run. Um, after, the, after the trade deadline, Shaq said that um, that talks stalled and never resumed. So to him, he knew he had to make a change because he says that once talks, once the talk stalls and they stop reaching out and they stop trying to negotiate, it means two things. You're either going to get released or there's going to be plans to make trades for you. Unfortunately, that was a year that they lost to the Pistons in five. Everyone favored the Lakers because of the big four, but... They didn't play enough. They didn't play together enough times. Carl Malone missed like half the season, almost a third of the season, because of a leg injury. Kobe Bryant was uh, dealing with his um his sexual assault trial at the time. There were times where he would go to court, come back and play the games. He would show up late, but those games were he he had said before that those games t uh, motivated him because of what the issues he was dealing. The minute he hit the court. He was home. So after the se after the season, the first play the first person to go from the Lakers is Phil Jackson. He gets let go. Then, then uh, Shaq was the next one to go. <clears throat> he goes to Miami. Carl Malone. He retires. Gary Payne gets traded. Guess who's the lone survivor? Kobe Bryant. After that, 
he got a seven-year contract extension. So he was the only one of that big player personnel that got his money. So it shows how important or how different it is, how a business point, like you said, it is. Now, before we move on, we I just received word <coughs> concerning the Los Angeles Rams, partner. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so the Rams, um, their RB Kyrie Williams will miss the the pretty much the whole offseason activities due to a foot issue. It seems like. So uh, this article just came out right now by ESPN, Sarah Barshop, staff writer. So uh, McVay announced this Tuesday that he, he will miss the team's offseason program due to a fit, foot issue. But McVay mentioned uh, there's pretty much nothing to worry about because worry about he'll be ready midway through training camp. But there is an issue when he is training, and I'll kind of just leave it at that, but nothing to be concerned about. Uh, what you, what you think about that news, uh, not too be, not too much on the worry side, or a little bit worry. Well, it makes you wonder how you're going to be used, how you're going to be proactive. I mean, McVay, <clears throat> excuse me, especially, especially with the addition of a third uh, runner back. You know, Boston Scott. You might you might think uh, that might be a little bit why they got another runner back. And don't forget, they still have that a uh, runner back, Jake Evans, I think, or Evans, who's a who who we drafted a couple years ago in the draft. So, because uh, McVay joked about uh, joked about it a little bit, but you never know; it could be in the long run, uh, pretty pretty bad. But who knows? Let's get you, uh, let me get your opinion. Well, I mean, come on, we we've been here before. Remember with Todd Gurley. You know, people said it was an issue. Turned out that he had arthritis, you know, because he was overused. And um, the fact that he had played well <clears throat> in that Super Bowl, it made you wonder what was going on. And then Cam Akers, when we got him, you know, how how that turned out. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't make too much of a deal here. I mean, I'd rather have it happen now than later. But it makes you wonder how they're going to have a running game if your main player can't stay healthy. I mean, look, when they were playing at the Coliseum, one of the advantages was they were playing on grass. When they're playing on grass, it helps your footing. But when you go into like turf, that's that's very that's a different story. And um so he broke his foot during the off season, during his rookie season. So that might be his his same foot that he has has, has been bothering him. Because later that year he did miss uh after injuring his ankle, the first game of two thousand twenty two. But they everybody says he's been great, but you never know because that same foot could lead to like you mentioned. We've been through it, talk early, man. So we know how it. The fact that he went out and got another running back shows that he's ready. We know what happened to this offense when he went out. The team struggled. They lost like four games in a row. You know, they fell to three and six. But when he came back, the tide turned, and that's why they were they went on that magical run to make the playoffs. So getting extra running backs is a good thing because you, you can rely on them. The question is, how you how is he going to handle the roster? That's pretty up to him, and that's still early to call. I can't really predict on what's going to happen as far as a running back game goes. Yeah, 100%. So we'll just leave it at that for now about that little breaking news that just happened. But on to the next. Yeah, I agree with you. We are going to continue to follow up on that. Again, McVay says it's not serious. At least, like I said, it's easy now. Um, the injury is now. I'd rather happen now than later. So uh, we'll, we'll monitor that closely. Um, so now we did we before now we go back to our topic. We're talking about the NBA playoffs. Now let's talk about the Western Conference. Um, it'll be the Mavericks against the Timberwolves.
But I want to go back to the Timberwolves series because that one was like a a very very odd series because we know Denver. I mean, Denver got off to a slow start. And then I felt that this series was going to be tough because they're they're they were losing their cool. Talk about the player that got fined for throwing stuff on the court, and I believe there was another fine for the use of obscene language. I believe. Yes, that's correct, partner. That's correct. So let me ask you this. How good are the Timberwolves? Because I saw it as this was a psychological game. They got into the Nuggets' head. And apparently they worked. Because twice near the end of the series, Denver had it, but they just could not close that door. Yeah, man. <laughs> it was a very odd series. Remember, it was 2 0. Nuggets 2 2. Then, um, then unfortunately, the uh, Nuggets ended up with that 3 2 uh, series lead until Timber was won the last two. But the game stand was something else, partner. I'm not sure if you've seen that game or if you've seen the highlights. Nuggets should have had pretty much at halftime. I had Nuggets already predicting them playing the, the Mavs. Pretty much half of the, I think half of everybody thought. That was gonna happen because of because um Anthony Edwards only had four points going into the halftime and they were down by like double digits. I think the key game, the key moment of the series was game six. Because all they had to do was win and they advance. Part of it, they didn't even show up that day. At the end of the first quarter, they're already down 14 points. Or 17 points. In the fourth quarter, they only put up nine points. Minnesota won every quarter that game six. It was never close. By halftime, it was pretty much out of it. Actually, by the start of the fourth quarter, it was already out of it. So, I think Denver knew that if they lost this game, they'd be in trouble. Game six was 115 to 70. Like, you got your kick in game six. Now, let's go to game seven. You were kicking their by 20 points. You were kicking their by 20 points. Apparently, you didn't kick that bad enough because they got back in it and they beat you. You know, I joke around and say, yeah, the Lakers were kicking their but at the end, it was the Nuggets that kicked the Lakers. I think it was more of cockiness to me. I think the Nuggets were over cocky. Especially when you were up 20. I don't care if you're up 30. You still play hard. There is no mercy rule in the NBA. They're not going to stop the game if you're kicking the other teams by 50 points. I called a game two years ago for a Long Beach City College football team. By halftime, it was 55-6. to six. The was already kicked. The other thing they changed was the fourth quarter went from a 15-minute period to a 12-minute period. A little bit of leniency, but there was no mercy rule. There is no mercy rule in the NBA. When you're up 20, you put your foot in the gas. It's game seven. Your championship reigns on the line. Apparently, we don't know what happened. It seems that the Timberwolves are just too much. And now look, we're having new champions, guaranteed. <clears throat> Yeah, man, you couldn't explain it any better because um, that was a very... I'm not even a Nuggets fan. It was a disappointing loss by them. 
after that hot time, they came out like a, like you say, overconfident. Because after that hot time, they were all talking, 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 and thought they were going to make it. But Timur was said, no, 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 here comes the wolves. And they dominated. Everybody contributed from bottom to top. The bench scored. The assistant coach, everybody scored. And they dominated them. Like that game six, you, you mentioned as well. Wow. It was a blowout. A big ass blowout by 45 points. The whole starters were sitting in the whole fourth quarter. The whole starting starters for the Nuggets were sitting in the whole fourth quarter. While the Timberwolves starters were still out there scoring and showing the who were going to advance. And that's what happened in game seven. Timberwolves make it. And it's going to be a tough series. I don't know who you got on the next one. Minnesota or Dallas. Doncic versus Anthony Edwards. At man. I'll leave it at this. Uh, and I'll give my last thought on this. When you look at the scores from this round. Except game seven. You look at the other scores. The team that won. Scored either 100 points or more. The team that lost. Did not score 100 points or more. So the key factor here was. Scoring. In the three losses. Denver. Did not score 100 points. In the three losses for Minnesota. It didn't score 100 points. So it just showed that if you hold the other offense down, you're going to win. Except the, except game seven, neither got close. One, they got close, but that's something different. What I'm saying is they knew each other's offense well. Because if you look at these scores, they're identical scores. But I think Denver was his two favorite. And honestly, I think I think their victory over the Lakers may have given them the confident boost, but I just think it was more of a cockiness because, you know, when they beat the Lakers, what did they do first? They slumped out the gate. They were down 0-2. Then they won the next two, and they actually won the next three, and they were on the verge of closing it out. They just couldn't do it. In the playoffs, I've seen that Denver is not a team that comes out of the of the gate strong. If you go back to the last round with the Lakers, guess who was on? Guess who was ahead of all the games? L.A. The only thing that the Lakers screwed up was they couldn't finish it. You look at the Denver Nuggets here in this series against the Timberwolves. They just they're not the, they were not the team that came out the, the gates fast, and that's the thing. They always got to play from behind. And you know what? Sometimes you get lucky and you'll win games, but you're not going to win from behind every time. The object of the game is to be ahead after the fourth quarter. But the object of the game is to come out early and, you know, place your stamp. So, I mean, you know, they always say when, when, when you play sucky, you know, you get sucky results in this point. Nuggets suck. They're out. New champions. So tomorrow is... Burner, you still talk to you about Lakers getting eliminated by the Nuggets? <laughs> well, I'm just saying that they're playing like the Lakers did. You would think you would learn from that series? Like, hey... We got to play better coming out of the gates. We just cannot keep falling behind every time. The difference is you can do that in a regular season and you can come back and rebound. This is a playoff matchup. Every game in the series is crucial because, remember, first to four wins. You want to learn an amazing fact? So the Nuggets this whole season were 0-12. and 12. Has a 0 and 12 record, 0 wins, 12 losses, when scoring less than 100 points. The Wolves were responsible for exactly half of them. 
So that determines the nugget. Uh, the Timberwolves pretty much knew every little thing about the Nuggets. That's why it was so uh, close. You know, every game, like like you mentioned, that fact tells it all. Nuggets are twelve this season, less than a hundred. Timberwolves responsible for half of them. Yeah, and again, when you don't usually when you go over a hundred, and not just that, the fact that the Timberwolves came back down twenty shows. Um, how good deadly they are. Yeah, and this is, I believe, for the first. I believe this is the first time that um the Wolves are in a conference finals. The last time they were there was the O four season against the um the again. I hate I hate to keep bringing this up, but the last time they were in the conference finals was against the Lakers. And. That uh, was Kevin Garnett in that team. That yeah, Kevin Garnett was the OG of the Timberwolves. Yeah, that was against Kobe and Shaq in the Big Four. But in that That's series, crazy. the Lakers took it in six. That was the last time they made it to that far. I mean, it's it's amazing now. Like you know, you you go back twenty years later. You know, they they actually made it. Right, right. it's been a decade. A decade. And, um, so what we got another uh, breaking news for that first game we were talking about for that Boston team who who had a great Christus Porzingis. He got hurt in the first round, I believe. He will be making his return back possibly as soon as game four, which is even better for the Boston Celtics, who has an ease for them if they're down. Uh, if anything goes wrong their first three games, Porzingis will be back game four. So it's gonna it's down to the last four, and man, it's gonna be a great, great battle to the end. I think the healthier one will will come out in front. Now let's talk about the Thunder real quick. So <clears throat> they go down, and they were the they were the top seeded team. Does it now show that you know no matter what seeding you're in, if you don't play your best, no matter against who, you're not gonna go far. I, I missed that part. Sorry about that. So my question was, you know, the Thunder were the top seeded. They went out. Does it show that no matter what seeding you're in, if you don't play your best, you're not going to make it far? No, I think uh, the Thunder's case, they were too young. Their, their, their oldest player was Hayward, who didn't even play a minute, who was already uh, came out with rumors already talking about how he was frustrated in his role. But I think the Thunder Thunder was too young, but they're gonna have this will be this will come back and get them in a good positive way and they'll have a bright future. Yeah, whatever, like you said, partner, whatever issues they have, you know, hopefully they can work it out. And then um again, it was a it was a great season. I mean, I do want to give my applause to them because they did have a great year, especially a young team and you know, after missing it for so long. You know, they deserve a lot of positive. No one, no one thought they would be so good. No one thought they'd be this good. But I expect this team, I mean, they're, they're young, like you said. You know, they might make a run. They're, they're going to be up there at least for the next couple of years, that's for sure. You know, and I'm looking forward to that. But now let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, that will be it for our section of the NBA playoffs. Let's um, go and talk about the other events that happened over the weekend. So you watch NASCAR, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> I I seen some. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I watch it. Yeah, partner. I do watch NASCAR. What's up? So over the weekend, um, the NASCAR Cup Series had their annual yearly all-star race. Um, I believe this was the second or the third year that um, 
that they had it at the uh, war, at the legendary uh, North Wilkesboro Speedway in, I believe, South Carolina or North Carolina. Now, Joey Logano won the race, took home the million-dollar prize. You know, that's good, right? But that's not what... That is not what the weekend was about, as we're about to let you listen. And I think my audio guy played the wrong video. I think uh, he's going to get fired. So, Parter, following a uh, incident on the racetrack between Ricky Stenhouse Jr. and Kyle Busch, uh, they met up in the garage after the All Star race, and I guess they tried to work things out, but that not that wasn't the case because after the race, uh, instead of race cars getting crashed, punches fly, and yes, that's right, punches fly. And and I don't mean punches fly on the racetrack. I'm talking about people getting hit. Uh-oh. A fight broke out in pit road between the two racers. And NASCAR is reviewing this. So there may be possible disciplinary actions. And maybe suspensions coming in. Uh, it's, a, it's a yearly race that they race for pride, not for points. But, I mean, well, how, how surprised were you that that happened? <laughs> I love it. Speaking of the funny part, like you mentioned, um, Joey Logano was the winner, but the thing that was going viral was the fight that broke out backstage in well in the pit with um. So pretty much, uh, Kyle Busch went up to St- uh, St- Stainhouse. Is his name? Uh, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. So well, apparently, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so he he was waiting for him. So Kyle Busch uh, walked to him. With the whole media and cameras behind them. So Ricky, they had a little quick combo. Then Ricky took the f- first swing, man. And even his dad took a couple swings and got punched as well. Yeah, so the incident happened on the racetrack uh, during the All-Star race. Uh, there was a clip where Kyle Busch in the eight, uh, he clipped uh, Ricky Stenhouse Jr., who was in front of him. And, you know, they were fighting for position. And you got to realize, North, North Wilkesboro is like a short track race. So it's not those uh, two-mile tracks. It's, it's basically like you can go three wide, but, you know, you might hit the wall. So um, I guess in retaliation, Kyle Busch kind of like hit him. And Stenhouse didn't like that. But after the race, again, they try to talk things out. But um, it turned into a fist fight. So, again... uh. We haven't heard anything from NASCAR. We, you know, it is being reviewed, and there may be fines and suspensions, but we don't know yet. Um, NASCAR is going to go to Charlotte this weekend for the yearly Coca Cola Six Hundred. Um, you can see that on Fox Sports One or Fox Sports this weekend, this Sunday night. Uh, since it is Memorial Day weekend, um, they will race from about three o'clock our time, and this is a long race, partner. This is a uh, six hundred miles. Uh, 600 miles, 309, almost 400 laps on a two-mile course. Yeah, man, that's a lot. I can't picture myself. What is that, like two, three hours of of pure just nonstop going? It's about a four-hour race. Yeah, man, I can't see that. I can't see myself in that position, especially with... When my stomach bubbles up, I don't know what I'll do. I mean, think about it. I mean, you're racing from the afternoon, and the race finishes at night. I, I always wondered, like, what if you pull up cramp or something? You know, in that pos- no wonder. Like, I'm never too familiar with the sport. Like, <clears throat> that's why they're saying it's comfortable or not, or what whatsoever. But you know a little bit about that. Well, they wear a fire suit, and then um they wear um different type of shoes when they're um 
when they're racing and their feet hurt because they're they're they're, they're stepping on the gas and the brake pedal. So it's it's a little difficult, but these drivers train for this. They're used to this. But this is a yearly tradition. Now, let's talk about the driver Kyle Larson, the number five Hendrick Chevy. He's doing double duties. In the morning or in the afternoon, he's going to be in Indianapolis for the famous Indianapolis 500. Then he's going to fly over to Charlotte to do the 600. So he's going to be doing about 1,100 miles on that day. In one day? Yeah, there's drivers... Um, that's crazy. Yeah, there's been drivers in, in NASCAR history that, that's done that. They run the, the the 500 and the 600 on the same day. So you look Does at anybody drivers, want to win in the, in the same day? Yeah, so you, look at, so you look at drivers like Tony Stewart, um, Robbie Gordon, you know, Kyle Larson. <clears throat> you know, they've um, they done the Indy 500 and they did the 600. Well, well, Ricky Rick Hendrick came out and said it would be extremely hard to pull Carl Darson out of the Indy 500 if there is weather in order to get him to the Coke 500 on time. So there's pretty much uh, well, weather concerns for that day as well for that first uh, Indy 500, right? Yeah, that'll be at the uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and then after the race, he's got a head head back to Charlotte and um to do the 600 yeah man um I don't know but I, uh, I think Stainhouse earned a new fan I'm a new fan of him but like you did mention um there is word going around that he can be pulled from the <clears throat> Indy 500 early to make it to the Charlotte Motor Speedway or he might miss the start of the 600, which meaning they got to have a backup driver, which don't know how that's going to play out. Yeah, I don't know about that, sir. I do not know about that. It's a tough one. It's done. It's been done before, but again, we'll just have to wait and see again. Indy 500 will be Sunday. You can see that on NBC. And then Fox will have the Coca-Cola 600. Uh, it'll be around 3 o'clock our time, 3.30. Again, that's a that is the longest race of the NASCAR Cup season on Memorial Day weekend. It's been a tradition. There's been traditions in NASCAR. Um, the Daytona 500 in February, um, the All Star Race in May, the Coca Cola 600 in Memorial Day weekend. Um, they used to do the Daytona five, the Daytona Night Race in July, but I believe it's a new tradition they're doing. And then we also have the uh, the Darlington Labor Day race, meaning. They race the day before Labor Day. So a lot of tradition is coming up, especially with the summer season coming. Yeah, for sure. They usually it's a American uh it's a America sport right there, man. It's a they respect their um their military or like the memorial, the holidays where you gotta respect, uh honor, support. Yeah, that's what's up, man. Yeah, doing props. No, normally NASCAR will, will, I don't know if they still do this, and I, I think they do, uh, but I know in the past they used to drive with decals on their car, honoring those who have, you know, given the ultimate sacrifice for the freedom of our country, and again, we want to express our gratitude for everyone who is serving in the U.S. Army, in the U.S. military, Marine Corps, Air Force, anything, you know, we thank you so much for your service, and we also want to honor those who have given the ultimate sacrifice so for us to live here in this country and I think what NASCAR is doing too is pretty much amazing they actually have decals where they honor a fallen soldier no matter if it's no matter what war it is um I mean, usually I've seen the family members there too attend the races they get to go see the races too so I mean that's that's pretty nice for them for NASCAR to do yes I agree 100 percent with that man for sure Respect. So I'm looking forward to to that Sunday, and hey, partner, you ready to talk some baseball? Let's get it. Okay, so the Dodgers, Dodgers been on a bit of a streak lately, especially one 
Shoni Otani. Yeah, Dodgers are finding the rhythm lately. Even though they had a, a, a okay start, everybody's finding the rhythm. That batting order from first to first to nine. They're all great hitters. Can't forget their pitching, man. They're gonna be a um, they're gonna be a playoff contention team. Just gotta stay healthy, like always. It's a long, long season. I'm more impressed about how Shoney Otani has been able to find his identity in blue. Uh, he's been good. He's been on a bit of a streak lately. He's been hitting the ball really hard and been hitting some home runs as well. And I believe last week he had like a walk off home run too in one of the games. Yeah, he's been going off lately in in his homestand that they have been going. He had a walk off hit. Like think like three or four home runs in a week. Got to give him his props, man. He's one of the best players. Can't for, just because he's not with the Angels, he's still one of the best players in MLB, man. Even with a with one one elbow that's pretty much messed up, he could still hit and hit those home runs and contribute for the team. Dodgers are in action tonight. They take on the Arizona Diamondbacks at uh, seven ten. Uh, Dodgers coming in at 33-17. and 17. Meanwhile, the D-backs are 22-26. and 26. Dodgers are uh, they're pretty, they're pretty much, much half a game from having the baseball's best record so far. The other team is the, the Phillies, who are 34-14. and 14. Then the Dodgers are 33-17. and 17. By a couple of games, but I think Dodgers are going to have the best record in this upcoming week. Now, when you see those two, are you lo- are you looking at a possible, maybe a NLCS preview matchup, uh, whenever they play again? Yes, a hundred percent. I can see that. That's one of the best matchups I could see. It. Or um, if Braves come out hot in the season, I could see a rematch. Uh, but Dodgers might go all the way, uh, in the American League with that. With the Yankees as well. Yankees Dodgers World Series. That'll be um that'll be cool. Well, they play tonight the uh, Dodgers and right now the Angels <clears throat> Angels are currently in Houston. Uh they're up two nothing in the top of the first. Uh right now um it is the top of the first, no no outs. And looks like the Angels have put up two runs in the board. It looks like uh, Ren Hifo homer to the right. So two run home. Let's go. Two run her on right. him. Angels are trying to um, get something going. They're at 19 and 29. Um, but are you impressed that, you know, they're playing hard? Yes. Despite, despite, the, uh, despite, the, well, uh, the... despite the, the circumstances, because... They did win yesterday. They beat the Astros nine seven. Now this game two. Oh so yeah, yeah. This this whole week and a half, they just been on fire with the bats. Like they're like so like their their bats just turn on fire. Their the their young studs are all turning up. Like yesterday's game, they they all homered, and there's a couple back to back homers. So the Angels been on fire with their best. It was just that one Rangers game that if not, they would have swept the Rangers, which Rangers are on top of that division, man. So, yeah, I'm pretty... Um, It got me off guard seeing them doing good, which I like. They're all young. They're all playing, giving their all. The Angels are coming in at uh, 19 and 29. Um, it, Do you see the Angels maybe... Making a run here because it looks like they've been the winners of. Uh, they won three of their last uh, four. Actually, overall they've won. Um, they won five of the last seven. Actually. Yeah, out of the last ten games, the Angels have a five-five record. Um, at home they have a six and sixteen record, which is horrible. At away, they actually have a five hundred average record, thirteen thirteen. But you said uh, if I could see the Angels making a run for the playoffs. Well, we'll have to see because right now they're they're in Houston. Mm-hmm. Again, they're, they're you mentioned me that right? 
Yeah, I mean, right now they're in Houston. Um, it's uh, game two of a three-game series. Um, <clears throat> we do want to let you know they do have a homestand coming up. They have a six-game homestand coming up from the 24th through Memorial Day weekend. Uh, oh. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, they will have yep, the Cleveland clean. Guardians here, one of the best teams in the AL. And then the gauntlet continues after the Guardians. The Yankees come in for the Memorial Day weekend. And then... The Angels will go off to Seattle on Memorial Day week. Yeah, this upcoming games are going to be very hard. They're they're all great teams, man. Guardians, Yankees. That Guardians series, I only see us getting one. That Yankees series, I only see us getting zero. And that Padres series, yeah, it's going to be a long season for the Angels. But I give them props for still going all at it. We're still a young squad rebuilding for sure. Well, the thing is the angels have a losing record at home. They're six and 16. Um, so hopefully they can probably get something going. And then again, Cleveland leads the, uh, the American league central. Uh, they just have a half game lead over Kansas city. The Yankees currently have a two game lead over the Orioles in the, in the American league East. And right now Seattle has a two game lead on Texas. And the AOS, Houston, is actually trying to get back up there. The Angels are just seven back, but they're one game behind or ahead of Oakland for last place. So <clears throat> um, if they want to at least try to salvage the season, I think this will be a crucial week, especially when you have the best teams coming in. Look, if they try to take maybe three, a two of three, um, that'd be a good thing. For each of the series? Well, yeah, for those two. Because right now, you know, you look at the wild card. Um, at the wild card standing, the Angels are just five and a half games back in the AL wild card. Yeah, yeah but I still think it's still early to be even in the wild card uh, discussion. But, um, yeah, who knows? We'll see. We'll, we'll see what they do at um, halftime, like during the All-Star game, which is in... In a couple months. Yeah, you wonder also uh, the way they perform will also um, show the status of Mike Trout, whether he'll be back this season. I mean, it's kind of like Aaron Rodgers and the Jets, you know. We bring him yep. back if it matters or, I mean, this is a guy that's paid, that's being paid a lot of money. So you kind of want to be careful how you handle it. Yep. That and he's one of the best players in this generation of baseball. You can never uh, push push him when he's not ready. You gotta clear before clear, then you can let him play. But oh, I can't see it this season. We just gotta do something and trade him. We're wasting his career. Well, Trout has said that he wants to stay an Angel. He doesn't want to go anywhere else, so. I mean, it's going to be up to Artie Moreno what he wants to do. Artie Moreno is up. Okay, looks like I lost my partner there. Oh, sorry. I, 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 um, I'm against Artie Moreno. That's the owner. Perfect. So I guess we can um, wrap it up with that one there. But um, you talk about the. Have you heard of the <coughs> of the UFL? Yes, sir. So. <coughs> so some and, news, and have you been news, keeping? Up? So some news came out of the UFL this week. Um, the rumor is that um. They are not going to expand in 2025. As of right now, the league plans to keep it at eight teams and possibly have two expansion teams um, in 2026. Also, one of the headlines that came out of this meeting is um, the league is debating on the 2025 start date of either March 1st or March 29th. 
So, <clears throat> big decisions coming out of um the UFL. Yeah, for sure. Um, I see the the only games I've been watching it was the St. Louis games that have been on on Fox. I just think they need a football team, which in which we talked about before. But um, I just hope the they got to get a great uh like a ex football star, somebody good to bring in a little bit more hype into that league. You know, I like the A team. Keep everything how it is, but you mentioned um they still don't have a twenty two two thousand twenty five season yet. Can you can you repeat that? You mentioned that there's they still don't know if there's gonna be a twenty twenty five season. No, they, they just don't know when to start. Oh, okay. No, I think uh they're still fighting the rhythm into the market, even though this is their first year. Uh, they collabed the UFL. So we'll see what, what happens this rest of the season and next year to see. Uh, what, we'll see what happens this rest of the season to see what their future holds. But they have great owners, for great um, partnerships. I think they'll do good. There's no concern as far as if it'll be back. They claim that it will be back. They just um, <clears throat> don't know if to either expand more teams because right now they're going to keep at eight because there's eight teams right now um also they want to know when to start the season i guess there's maybe there is an issue with it we don't know <clears throat> and then um i think so they're thinking of adding two teams by 2026 so um we'll keep track of that but um, i'm gonna stay with football here and we're gonna talk about the chiefs uh, a lot of things have been coming out of kansas city as a late partner So, um, oh, yeah, sorry about that. So, what we know is, uh, Rashi, Rashi Rice was arrested, um, this week, um, over the weekend, and he's facing, uh, <clears throat> he's facing eight felonies. And then, um, he, uh, he's also being accused of allegedly punching a photographer. How about that? Yeah, but about that, uh, on May 20th, uh, the Chiefs kicking off their organized team activities. Rashid Rice will be attending and pers- participating in the activities. So uh, none of that is going to be affecting him on the field as of now. Well, my concern is like about Commissioner Roger Goodell because of that personal conduct policy. You wonder, you know, if these latest incidents, you know, violate that. And, you know, if, you, if he's looking at a possible suspension for, you know, violating the code of conduct, pretty much. Well, one of the cases, uh, the injured person that he got, he assaulted on May 6th at the Dallas nightclub. He, 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 he refused to file charges. So that will most likely couldn't get shot. Yeah, and, you know, and it it didn't stop there. You know, Kansas City was full of controversy this past week. Um, So we talked about Richie Wise facing a felony and, you know, punching the photographer for whatever reason. Um, The punter, Harrison Butker, uh, has been facing backlash um, for giving one of the most controversial graduation speeches, I guess you want to say, in recent memory. Um, we're not gonna really go into it deep because it's political, and we don't want to kind of get into that right now. Um, I haven't. Um, I've heard about it, but I don't really know what's going on. But I rather not even. I just know there's a lot of controversy, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. I'm not gonna go into it much, but I do know that he made some uh, controversial remarks. Um, I guess regarding working women or something, and. He was against, you know, President Joe Biden and his policies and the other stuff. And it drew a lot of criticism, especially the latest was from uh, Matthew Stafford's wife. Uh, came out and spoke about it. Um, I guess she wasn't very appreciative of what he had said. Um, but there's just a debate going around as far as freedom of speech goes. So, I mean, we'll just leave it at that. So, 
as of right now, he's not going to face any disciplinary action from the NFL. I mean, they did condemn it, but, I mean, that was pretty much it. They're not going to suspend him or whatever. Uh, also, no one else from the Chiefs organization has pretty much came out and said anything. Uh, I could be wrong on that, but from what I've you know heard, uh, there's no division or nothing. And also, um, the Chiefs are going to be going to the White House as part of the tradition uh, you know, they go meet the president when you win a championship. Uh, he has been invited still. You know, there's no been no uh, no outcry from that. So, I mean, we'll see how that goes. And talk about, you know, being a first-round draft pick. Here's another incident that happened in Kansas City. Uh, first-round draft pick, wide right receiver Xavier Worthy. His car got stolen. As soon as he found a place in Kansas City, within the same day, his expensive car got stolen. Man, how do you want to be a? How do you want to play in a city where you got your car stolen? I mean, that, 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 that's crazy. <laughs> it's a similar situation that happened last season with our our wide receiver for the Rams, Demarcus Robinson, who got his chain stolen in downtown Los Angeles, which was priced over. Fifty to a hundred thousand. Yeah, I wonder. So, yeah, I get it. Wonder who, wonder who stole it. Pretty got it. Must have got a big payout on it. You know. <laughs> but I mean, talk about talk about that, and then finally the uh, the last incident in Kansas City. Uh, two of the team's offensive linemen have been arrested for a marijuana possession. That's right, marijuana possession. Apparently, you can still get busted for that. <laughs> yeah, it's 2024. Uh, Kansas, I guess, still has a marijuana as their legal, illegal substances, which is only a misdemeanor. It's not that bad, but still, I, I, I'm counter that. But you, who knows? But Kansas, <laughs> the Kansas City Chiefs are looking like a. Like Great Iron Game from that movie by The Rock. I thought you were gonna say they were looking like the crew from the uh, from the Adam Sandler <laughs> movie, The Longest Yard. Oh, The Longest Yard. <laughs> That's another great example as well. <laughs> and that's. Your her latest yep. headlines from Kansas City. <laughs> then there's been rumors about Justin Jefferson not uh, intending activities with the Minnesota Vikings offseason with the team and his uh, practice activities. And there's been rumors that he wants to go to the Jets. And he's been on um, people out there, I guess there's pictures, videos of him going to New Jersey or where. The Jets facility is located. So who knows? That would be insane. And I'll call the, I'll be a Jets fan. Psych. But who, who? what you think about that, Justin Jefferson? I thought you were a Jets fan because of Aaron Rodgers already. No, nah, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> so yeah, man, Justin Jefferson is a monster to be out there and not... He hasn't been negotiating with his team or even intending no type of like team activities. Well, I mean, it's uh, it's off season. I mean, there some some players can consider it mandatory, but I mean, the OTAs are pretty much just to get ready for the uh, the real work in the off season, which is training camp and preseason. Um, but yeah, we'll see how that goes for sure. But speaking then, um... speaking of speaking of training camp. The Rams have a new location for their training camp. So after being at UC Irvine the last couple of years, the Rams are moving their camp this year to Yo to Loyola Marymount University this summer. Hey, I'm not sure where it's at, to be honest. It's somewhere in the but LA area, that's for sure. <laughs> but uh, Loyola Marymount University is hosting the Rams camp this year, so... If anyone wants to go, visit Rams.com to get your reservation spots. I'm into the Rams. Cool. 
Oh, was that partner? Like, you I think it's cool? Like, I've been there before. It's, it's, it's awesome. Oh, yeah? Yeah. What's closer, Irvine or Loyal? Uh, for me, it was Irvine. Even though it's far, I think Irvine was closer for me. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, it's like a 20 minute drive. Who knows? Might take a trip out there uh, if they let public in or not. Oh no, I'll well, be better for the university they students. They usually do let um, they usually do let the the uh the public in for free. You just have to reserve a spot. Um, you can um. <clears throat> You can um, I lost my thought. I'm sorry. No, but uh, you can um, you can go, you can reserve your spot, get free tickets, and you can um, check out the Rams, uh, the Rams training camp. I've been there. I went the year after they won the Super Bowl. I got to take a picture with the trophy. It, it's pretty cool, nice. you know. Yeah, I never been to it. Must have been nice, man. Yeah, but I want. At first, they were holding it at Thousand Oaks, then UC Irvine, and now it's um, Loyola Marymount. So uh, let's see how the turnout will be if they'll keep it there this year. But, I mean, again, it'll be interesting to, to kind of, like, see this. Yeah. It, yeah. Makes me want to go uh, sightseeing there. But um, I want to go over. Uh, so the Rams are fifth in the league for their – for the O line groups on their base cap, their base on cap, which is sixty six point fifty million. Um the Panthers have the most expensive one at seventy three point twelve million, which I think should be like that because of Bryce Young needs help on the O line. Then the Rams we needed it, you know. I've always I have uh, I've wanted another O line, but I think we should be good how we are right, right now. Yeah, the O line was is what gave the Rams trouble <clears throat> two years ago. Um, last year it was uh, pretty much of a big improvement. Um, Stafford played the full well, he played the full season, except the last game be, uh, because you know he he rested. But, I mean, he had a productive year. I was very disappointed that he didn't win the Comeback Player of the Year. I believe um, he should have won it based on his stats. Um, I know they gave it to Joe Flacco, which I guess it's deserving because, I mean, this, they signed this guy off the streets and, you know, he leads you to the playoffs. But Stafford came back from injury and he led the Rams to the playoffs, let alone he had a rookie receiver who broke a lot of records. You know, I just think that's a criminal criminal mind and that needs to be investigated yeah 100 percent. i think joe flock will stone it right from him which is deserving you know like you mentioned he was just home one day and he got the call then he takes the team to the playoffs and it's the browns so that's that makes it even more crazier stafford always man i think stafford this year hopefully should be a, another great year by him Then I want to go uh, off some other news that broke out these couple of days. I'm gonna go a little quick uh, detail. So um, so this past week, fanatics are f filing a lawsuit against the rookie Marvin Harrison Jr., the wide receiver, for um, allegedly uh, not going with his contract. He's not signing autographs like he's supposed to. He's not doing um. So the the Arizona Cardinals are not are not even his, selling his jersey yet because of that same reason, in which he's not presenting himself no uh, with fanatics or accepting nothing at all. What you think about that? That's the first time ever it has happened. Well, did they mention if um, there was any problems as far as the neg negotiations go? No, no, he just has has been getting fined and um. He he signed back in March 2023, 2023 but supposedly it was a non-exclusive and it ended in April 2024. So there's so there's there's there's, there's a big problem going on, a lot of mixture around him right now. So yesterday all the rookies were presented in LA. He wasn't on, he wasn't even there, so 
I mean, Who if knows? he's not under contract, then he shouldn't be getting in trouble from the way it sounds. Yeah, but Fanatics are filing a lawsuit against them as of now. Then do you remember the the runner back David Johnson, who used to be a former Arizona Cardinals and Houston Texans? Yeah. Yeah, so he he will be retiring from the NFL. Uh, he had a great career, you know. I remember him um, scoring a couple touchdowns on, on us as well when the Rams would play the Cardinals. Uh, congrats on his departure from the NFL. It's always great to see uh, retiring with a cool career. Yeah, and then I also have been hearing rumors about Aaron Donald. What about Aaron Donald? What about him? What about him? That he may not be done. He may come back. Yeah, a lot of people are saying that. And I could see it. He's still young. You know, if we do good, shh, breaking news on a, on the Sunday, four in the morning, break. Uh, Aaron Donald joins the team once again. I mean, he might try to pull a Eric Weddle like he did that one time. <laughs> yeah, I didn't expect Eric Weddle, but he won a ring with us. What can you say? Well, I got the phone call. Like, somebody called me and said, hey, did you hear Eric Weddle? Like, what about him? Yeah, he signed. He came off the retirement list and didn't play with us. He didn't do much, but he did contribute. You know, he did he, what he had to do. He missed a couple of tackles, but he did had a couple key plays. Got to give him his props. He got his ring. One year, one. One uh, was the one year, one done. Then another news that I want to break out. I want to congratulate. Congrats to Tyreek Kill. On having his um on his tenth ch- child born, in his thirty years of life, I want to give congrats to him. And another he's news that broke. Father, he's a father with ten kids. Yeah, so he's gonna be having his tenth kid with his first, his other wife, expecting her first child. And other news, sad news to break out. So the Baltimore Ravens. The Baltimore Ravens have been linked to former Bengals and Jets edge rusher Carl Larson. Oh no, I got that mixed up, but yeah, they're they're looking into signing him. And another retiree as well. So Devontae Parker, wide receiver who played with the Patriots, the Dolphins, is retiring after nine seasons in the NFL. He was also an Eagle as well. I always liked him as a player. I would have him on my and uh, on my Madden teams. Should have got him on your fantasy team. <laughs> then one last news uh, I want to break out for the NFL category. Uh, so the Ravens are meeting with former C- Seahawks Jamal Adams. I wonder what that was all about. Business. Yeah, one year. That is interesting. Yeah, the Ravens are going to be a tough se- uh, team this season. They're up there. They've always been the top team up there. They just haven't been able to get past the Kansas City curse. I mean, everyone figured they were going to beat the Chiefs because the Chiefs had to do it on the road, and they never done that in the three years. And they did it for the first time, and I was like, man, I can't believe it. And then, you know, we'll just see how well they do. I mean, there are they have changes. Their Odell Beckham ain't there no more. Um, we'll just have to see how Lamar Jackson goes. Um, again, he's uh, he's like the only MVP quarterback I've seen not playing a Super Bowl. It seems like every year they're getting closer and closer. This last year was just upset by Patty Mahomes. So, you want to keep going with NFL or you want to go another sport? Well, that sound means is we're pretty much time's up for today. Um, but we, we're going to be back Thursday uh, for another edition. We're going to talk about the NBA Western Conference, Eastern Conference final matchups. <clears throat> we'll also talk about the Angels and Dodgers as summer approaches turn of the calendar we'll talk more about this in the coming days but we do want to thank you guys for tuning in today if you missed the live version you can catch us on Podbean, 
Spotify and iHeartRadio. It will be up there later on today. And partner, you got any last words? Thank you. Thank you. Another day. Another day. Yeah, another day, another podcast. Again, we want to thank you all. Continue to subscribe and follow, follow, follow. We got some interesting things we're working on for the summer. And we hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you for joining us. For Jesus and myself, thanks for watching Sport Talk. We'll see you next time.